And I'd like to thank Dr. Tomasian for the invitation to give this talk. Today I'm going to speak about Reyes Lopez Tijerina, the Texas-born evangelical preacher who found the 1960s land-grant activist organization, the Alianza Federal de Mercedes. The recent upsurge in both land and water rights activism in the last two decades, along with the opening of movement-era archival collections, including those of Tijerina and his political nemesis, Senator Joseph Montoya, has led to a renewed academic interest in Reyes Lopez Tijerina and, to a lesser extent, land rights. New studies by David Correa and Lorena Oropesa have reconsidered the significance of Tijerina by studying first state-sponsored violence against the Alianza and by exploring how Reyes interpreted and manipulated the memory uh, of the past to both support land claims and to assure of his primacy in land grant studies. These revealing studies are a far departure from the hagiographies of Tijerina of the 1960s and 70s and make considerable efforts at exploring the motivations and tribulations of land grant heirs that made up the Alianza in the 1960s and 70s. New scholarship on Tijerina, however, fails to place Tijerina and the Alianza in the context of modern land grant history or in Hispano land tenure across the 20th century. Rather than a work land grant history around the life of Reyes Lopez Tijerina, I attempt to place Tijerina in the broader context of land grant and land tenure in the modern era. There remains a significant gap in the histories of land grants and of land tenure. By and large, these histories tend to focus on protest and militant resistance. They skip the actions of Las, Blanca, Las Coras Blancas and La Mano Negra in the late, late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Tijerina, the Alianza, and the land grant movement of civil rights era in the 1960s, ignoring all other land grant and land tenure history in between. Now this is significant because in this time are the formations of political attitudes and people's conception of the role of this uh, government, both federal and state, and their dispossession and the responsibilities of those governments to uphold these rights. So in this lecture, I will sketch both briefly and quite broadly the story of land grants in the modern era, paralleling the story with the life of Reyes Lopez Tijerina. My hope is that by telling these stories together, we will see that the land grant movement of the 1960s was not the providential meeting of a messianic leader and his flock, but rather a time when the seed of radicalism and the charisma of a former preacher found fertile ground and the decades of injustice perpetuated on land grant communities in New Mexico. Putting the story of Tijerina in a New Mexico context will position Reyes in the larger land grant history, where stories of the era suggest otherwise. I posit that Tijerina's success was ultimately the restoration of the legitimacy of Hispano land claims in New Mexico by challenging trends that transformed New Mexicans from poor landed farmers to, to the working urban poor. New Mexico's Hispanos faced the loss of their lands from the moment that the United States Army took New Mexico in 1846. Over the next decades, their rights were slowly eroded through land, to the land adjudication process, processes that were strict enough to question the legitimacy of colonial documents and measurements done in mets and bounds, but lax enough to allow for a mass market where land speculation by an ethical lawyers uh, benefited most. In the 19th century, Hispano community grants were increasingly seen as adversarial to the preservation of the public domain. Land adjudication by the Office of the Surveyor General became progressively more corrupt as Eastern attorneys partnered with Hispano and Anglo elites to gain interest in private and community grants. Fraudulent claims were aggrandized by land surveyors conducting surveys paid by the foot and approved by friendly courts headed by land speculating judges. In the 1880s, U.S. Surveyor General George Julian believed that his office was powerless to preserve the public domain and recommended the creation of a body empowered to fight the corruption of the Santa Fe Ring. Created in 1891, the Court of Private Land Claims rejected more claims than the Office of the Surveyor General. Though this guarded against more fraudulent claims, it drew land adjudication deeper into a legal system antagonistic to communal land use and ownership. Citizenship hardly aided Hispano's defense of their land claims. The elongated confirmation process made Hispano community and quasi-community grants vulnerable to land speculation. 
vulnerable to lawyer speculation, excuse me, especially by the grants of lawyers. Those land grants whose property survived the stricter adjudication process and gained confirmation were still susceptible to legal partition. Introduced by, to New Mexico by con, uh, Congressional Delegate Stephen B. Elkins in 1876, the partition suit allowed a grant claimants to petition the Territorial District Court for a partition of property. If a fair partition was not made, the entire communal property was sold at auction and the proceeds divided amongst the owners. Lawyers who gained a partial title as their legal fee nearly always sued for partition immediately after the grant's confirmation. And if the lawyers failed to gain title through the adjudication process, they often pursued disenfranchised or indebted heirs and convinced them to sue for partition. The Mora, Las Trampas, Hakona, Petaca, Vallecito, Quebrelumbe, and Alameda grants were among the many that lost a portion or all of the communal lands for partition suits. Hispanos were dealt an additional blow to their communal land holdings to the U.S. versus Sandoval case of 1897. This U.S. Supreme Court case involved the San Miguel del Vado land grant but affected six other grants. And it claimed that the ejido lands that the community relied on were the property of the Spanish crown. Community land grants were thereafter restricted to their individual allotments. The court held that under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, common lands came under the ownership of the United States as the new sovereign. Heirs' claims were reduced to the private holdings, and the ejido was added to the growing public domain. Now, where Pueblo Indian land grants were considered perfected community grants, where lands around the settled areas of the grant were the property of no particular residents, but of the Pueblo as a whole, courts considered non-Indian community grants as imperfect community grants. The court reasoned that in imperfect or Hispano municipal grants, the unallotted common land still belonged to the government, not to the local grants, and was always subject to national, national control and disposition. Hispano communities lost land and land use rights precisely at a time when their population was booming. The growing population encroached on Pueblo lands, and when Pueblos gained protection uh, of the state in the 19-teens, the federal government faced the problem of 12,000 non-Indian settlers on Pueblo lands. Taking this guardianship seriously, it attempted to keep New Mexico out of Pueblo Indian Affairs by ordering the territory surrender any jurisdiction over Indian Affairs as stipulation to statehood in the 1910 Enabling Act. Nonetheless, the federal government took no action when U.S. Senator Holm Bursum of New Mexico introduced a 1922 bill that would privatize large portion of Pueblo reservations and recognize the title of non-Indians without penalty or, rec or compensation for Pueblo. The Burson bill drew support from the Secretary of Interior and former New Mexico Senator Albert B. Fall, who was involved in land speculation um, through the territorial era, as well as attorney and historian Ralph Emerson Twitchell, who authored the legislation. John Collier, Edgar B. Hewitt, Mary Austin, Mabel Dodge Lujan, and a host of other India files rose in opposition. Native delegates from the 20 New Mexico Pueblos met in Santo Domingo in November of 1922 and formed the All Indian Pueblo Council and adopted a memorial that, published, that was published in major national publications, including The Nation, The New York Times, and Survey Magazine. This nationwide publicity campaign both vilified Senator Burson and Secretary Fall and successfully defeated the Burson Bill and many successor bills. After contentious deliberations, the Pueblo Lands Board Act was passed in 1924, lacking the unconditional protection of Pueblos that Collier called for and maintaining an avenue for non-Indian settlers to retain their legitimate land claims. Now, while New Mexico is in the thick of the Pueblo lands controversy, Antonio and Evelinda Lopez Tijerina welcomed their fifth child. Reyes was born in September of 1926 in Apoth, in Texas, cotton field, where his mother had picked half a sack of cotton before birthing her son on that sack. His family were dirt poor migrant workers who followed seasonal work throughout southwestern Texas. They often worked for months on end in a stranger's fields, only to be thrown off by landowners after the harvest. His mother, Edlinda, died in 1933, losing a painful battle with breast cancer, leaving Antonio to raise two daughters and five sons. The children, Anselmo, Margarito, Ramon, Maria, Reyes, and Josefa, would travel between Texas and Michigan with their father, Antonio, as migrant workers. Cristobal, the youngest child who in the future was 
incredibly important to the Alianza, remained in Texas and was raised by an uncle. The untimely death of Reyes's mother affected him deeply. Erlinda's faith became Reyes's driving force, and he would spend his life exploring the faith, that faith, with his mother's example in mind. And the rigid class, racial class system of Texas's agricultural fields embittered Reyes, leaving a stark impression of Anglo-Mexican relations in his mind. In New Mexico, where the state's most choice property remained firmly in federal hands, and the state government had a small tax base, the poor state government leaned heavily on private landowners, including community land grants, to pay their delinquent taxes. Uh, cash poor communities, barely achieving subsistence, were forced to sell off portions of their common lands to pay these debts. Language communities like Santa Cruz lost land to irrigation districts created by commercial growers to control water rights and seize tax delinquent lands. Now, when these schemes failed, the state often inherited the land along with the tax liability and the debt left by defunct irrigation districts. Collecting on tax delinquencies in large state lands for two decades until the federal until federal relief finally ended this practice in 1934. Combined with tax delinquencies, the creation and expansion of US national forests in the first two decades of the 20th century exacerbated the dismal situation in land right communities. Already dependent on migratory wage labor to bring money into cash poor economies, Pueblo and Hispano villagers increasingly lost access to land they traditionally used to maintain meager but stable livelihoods. The expansion of the railroad, mining, and agricultural industries from the 1880s to the 1920s brought necessary cash into local economies, as well as drawing populations from villages already overusing dwindling resources. Droughts in the late 1920s and the market crash in 1929, however, destroyed agribusiness throughout the Rocky Mountain West, nearly closing the migratory labor trail that extended from northern New Mexico all the way to the Pacific Northwest. By the beginning of the New Deal in the 1930s, nearly every village in northern New Mexico qualified for federal assistance. And three years later, the whole region, Indian pueblos and Hispano villages alike, was a federal dependency. Now, relying on land use permits from the federal government, Hispanos were typically more economically vulnerable than their Pueblo Indian counterparts. Soil Conservation Service annual reports for the late 30s show that while Indian Pueblos benefited from a variety of experimental stations and Soil Conservation Service emergency work that employed CCC labor, projects aimed at alleviating Hispano unemployment were short term and often involved building access roads to fuel wood areas at their most intensive. The SES suggested radical changes in the way the federal government provided relief and employment to Hispanos and Pueblo Indians in New Mexico, criticizing predecessor programs and projects that created an endless state of dependency. Beginning in 1934, the government began an aggressive policy of purchasing former land grant lands, releasing these public and federal lands to local usage, and restoring traditional usufruct rights was among the most radical ideas of the Conservation Service all of which aimed at restoring the area's economic self-sufficiency. The Interdepartmental Rio Grande Committee, formed of representatives from all federal programs in the area, considered some SES proposals and very briefly advocated the return of land use rights across the Rio Grande watershed. <coughs> After the New Deal, radical reformers were purged from domestic employment and many were transferred to the State Department programs in Latin America. Federally purchased land grants were gradually incorporated into federal lands. The Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management being the most obvious beneficiaries of this practice. But how Hispano villages and Indian pueblos experienced this transfer was uneven. The Ojo del Espiritu Santo land grant in the Rio Puerto region and the Ramon Vigil land grant in the Tiwa Basin, both with long controversial histories of conflicting claims and alleged fraud made their way through various government agencies before eventually becoming part of the Jemez and San Ildefonso Pueblo reservations. And the Lo de Padilla grant, long contested by Isleta Pueblo, eventually became part of the Isleta Reservation, which also received a portion of the Antonio Cedillo grant, which it shared with Laguna. From the 1920s to the 1940s, federal policies in some divided Pueblo and Hispano communities and amplified the growing antagonism between these two communities. <coughs> Now in 1940, Antonio Tijerina moved his family to Michigan in search for work in the state's growing agricultural industry while seeking to escape Texas's harsh racism. 
And in 1942, a local Baptist preacher visited the Tijerina residence and gave the family a copy of the Bible. Reyes had read the Bible obsessively, developing a passion for the Old Testament while memorizing passages and reinterpreting scripture. The Bible, more than the theology of any denomination, became central to Reyes' socio-religious formation. Reyes' thirst for studying the Bible and compelled him to return to Texas to enroll in the Latin American Bible School in Saspampo in 1944. Despite his unwavering faith, Reyes became restless in Bible school. As he became acquainted with the Bible and advanced in his religious training, he came to feel that the religious world failed to shelter brown people from fear and terror that they suffered in their daily lives. In 1946, Reyes left the seminary in pursuit of religious self-discovery. Later that same year, he married a fellow evangelist, Mario Escobar. Despite his growing defiance of traditional evangelical beliefs, Reyes, who was already quite popular for his evangelical gift, was still assigned Spanish-speaking parishes in southwestern Texas by the Assemblies of God District in Isleta. Now, Reyes spent 1947 and 1948 fervently preaching in the fields of Texas uh, to migrant farm workers. In July of 1947, Maria gave birth to their first child, and in February, on February 2nd, 1949, she gave birth to Rosita. This was 101 years after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And for Reyes, Rosita was a living, breathing symbol of the injustice brought upon the Indo Hispano, a testament to a people abused and betrayed by the government. The birth of his daughter further inspired, inspired Reyes to devote his life to the righteous pursuit of justice. Throughout 1949 and 1950, Reyes rummaged through bookstores in his visits to Mexico, seeking information to prove the Indo-Hispano prerogative to titles of many former land rights. And in 1952, he returned to the United States to accept uh, parish ministry in Texas. Now, at the same time, in the early 50s, the limits of radical reform were apparent in northern New Mexico, where federal programs once ad advocated for land repatriation by the late 1940s, the focus on preserving New Mexico's villages waned. And New Mexico lapsed without this, this um, kind of liberal, radical, federal support, New Mexico lapsed in, to a state of decay that was familiar in the 1920s. Wartime mobilization initially stabilized the economy, but jobs were won at the cost of leaving the village, often permanently. And the parallels between the 1920s and 1950s are alarming. Like the 1920s, the 1950s saw an, increasingly, an increasing number of laborers journeying north to work in agricultural fields across the Rocky Mountain West this time migrating with their families. In spite of the efforts of New Deal reformers to preserve the villages of northern New Mexico, village and Pueblo depopulation accelerated as families flowed to growing cities like Albuquerque and Denver. Like the 1920s, the 1950s were fraught with dubious federal land policies and the corporatization of forest resources, favoring timber companies over <coughs> subsistence users. Unlike the 1920s, the 1950s were not followed by a half decade of intense federal relief programs. Rather, in the 1960s, the federal and state governments continued ignoring the situation in both Hispano villages and Indian pueblos. And even economic development drew both Hispanos and pueblos into growing economies. The 1950s proved a transitional time for Reyes as well. After 10 years preaching faith and in, pre preaching faith and justice, Tijerina moved his family and followers to Arizona in 1955. With the help of loyal friends, these families sought the realization of their own utopia in the deserts of Arizona and created a commune that they called El Valle de Paz, the Valley of Peace. At El Valle de Paz, Reyes adopted the name Irrateo, meaning angry God. And in April 1956, he and Maria named their third daughter Iradela, or Ira de Allah, Ire of God or wrath of God. That same year, Reyes was invited by Los Hermanos Penitentes to observe, and to visit and observe the life and conditions in Northern New Mexico. Inspired by his visit, Reyes spent the next three years, from 1957 to 60, visiting libraries and bookstores and archives throughout Mexico and the Southwest. In that period, he expanded his research endeavors, traveling to Madrid, Spain, um, Mexico de Efe, the federal district, and Washington, D.C., 
searching for documentary evidence to support his growing convictions regarding land grant issues and justice. In 1957, Reyes and the 17th families of Irvaya de Paz abandoned their utopian dream when the community was burned out of existence by their neighbors. From its creation, Valle de Paz was repeatedly attacked from the surrounding Anglo communities and harassed by the local political establishment. Reyes, Maria, and their five children and some of the other families relocated to Mexico later that year. Living first in the Rio Abajo, Reyes spent the next two years talking with community members, gauging popular perceptions, and attempting to grasp the complexity of the land grant situation in New Mexico um, firsthand. Rey has now entered a new phase of activism by establishing relationships with several Latin American human rights organizations, including the Frente Internacional de Derechos Humanos and the Frente Mexicano por Derechos Humanos. The relationships proved to be longstanding and furthered his social justice concerns, and also raised the, the kind of the international profile of land grant activism in New Mexico. By 1960, however, his restlessness led him to move to Albuquerque to further his efforts and appeal to a broader population base. On February 2nd, 1963, 115 years after the United States and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Alianza Federal de Mercedes, the Federal Alliance or Federated Alliance of Land Grants, was born at a meeting in Reyes's Fourth Street home. In September, the Alianza, seeking to expand its membership, held its first official convention in the Rio Grande High School gym, right in the heart of the Atlisco Land Grant. This quick, elevation, uh, this quick evolution of the Alianza did not fail to draw the attention of local officials. Reyes's past association with the Alianza's defunct predecessor, La Corporación de ABQ in northern New Mexico, had already acquainted the state authorities with Tijerina's radical ideas. Thus, the very founding of another land grant organization was an explicit, explicit challenge to New Mexico status quo. The next three years were important to the vitality of Tijerina's new organization. From 1963 to 1966, Reyes and Alianza leadership worked tirelessly traveling around the state and uh, rebuilt Winnebago, writing articles for local newspapers, uh, the news chieftain in Socorro, and published a pamphlet called The Spanish Land Grant Question Examined. This self-published pamphlet would be considered the Alianza's manifesto and drew on international law citing the initial violation of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as the original sin of the Anglo-Protestant state against the Anglo-Hispano people. The alienation from traditional farming and increased poverty created a seedbed for political radicalism, but a radicalism unlike the militant youth-oriented Chicano and American Indian movements that grew more and more vocal across the nation. In New Mexico, traditional tribal Traditional tribal religious leaders, not a radical youth faction, <coughs> led Taos Pueblo's fight for the return of Blue Lake, the Blue Lake from the U.S. Forest Service. Likewise, the membership of the Alianza, Federal de Mercedes, was primarily comprised of older land grant leaders, including Korean, World War II, and even some World War I veterans. And it was during these formative years that Reyes gained a loyal and vocal following, and the Alianza grew in membership to more than 1,500 members. So why may we ask did the Alianza grow? What had Tijerina addressed that his predecessors had not? And how was he able to create unity, albeit selective and fragile amongst land grants, who up till then were known for their insularity? For Reyes, the pursuit of justice was central to nearly anything he did, from his preachings as a Pentecostal minister as a Pentecostal minister in the 40s and 50s to his work with the Alianza in the 60s and 70s, through to his work with successor organizations like the Instu Institute for the Research and Study of Justice in the 1980s. In his pursuit of justice, Reyes was able to address more vividly than any of his predecessors a central component, one that had consistently been attacked for more than a century, century prior to the Alianza's founding. This was the, legitimate, the legitimacy of Hispano land claims and land tenure. In his speeches, radio broadcasts, letters, and so on, and in Alianza publications and literature, proving that injustice was perpetuated upon land grants was central to Reyes's message. As he gradually chipped away at claims that blamed New Mexicans' own torpidity for the economic situation, Reyes restored not only the legitimacy of Hispano land claims, but the legitimacy of their 
history and ultimately the, the, their legitimacy as a people. Now, there was a significant tide that Baez was trying to turn because, um, and to this day, many people were critical and are critical of Baez's failure to realize or fully articulate the double colonial context of New Mexico Hispano claims. Um, you know, this, the, the double colonial context, of course, is the Spanish oppression of uh, Native Americans and then the Anglo oppression of the Spanish. Um, now, while there is some truth to this, Reyes' claims for justice was based on documents that offered equal protection to non-Indians and Indians alike. And this division between non-Indians and Indians was softer in Reyes' rhetoric than in the minds of many New Mexicans. Knowing that the term uh, Mexican would meet resistance in New Mexico, Reyes used the term Indo-Hispano, which was an explicit recognition of both Spanish and indigenous roots. In his reading of Spanish colonialism, Reyes found documents that he believed protected Hispano and Pueblo land rights. The laws of the Indies, particularly Book 4, contained numerous regulations that outlined the proper treatment of Indians and the consultation of surrounding tribes before granting of land or water rights to colonial settlers. The Treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which made no mention of Indians other than the responsibilities of US and Mexico to guard against nomadic raids across the border, treated the Pueblos as citizens, a status that provided mixed protection throughout the Mexican period and <coughs> would erode Pueblo land rights during the American territorial era. But despite the comments of his detractors, of his detractors Reyes far from celebrated the colonial era. He rarely drew on the social history of colonial New Mexico. What he did was reinterpreted New Mexico as this collection of free city-states, almost like in, in the Roman model. He even changed the name of the Alianza to, to reflect this idea from the Alianza Federal de Mercedes to the Alianza Federal de Pueblos Libres, from grants to free city-states, and idealized an egalitarian colonial society rather than the semi-feudal system that dominated New Mexico, this patron peon relationship. While Reyes was far from a colonial scholar, he did connect Hispano land rights to colonialism, something that past scholars failed or were reluctant to do. From LeBaron Bradford Prince to Ralph Emerson Twitchell, Max Frost, Paul A.F. Walter, to Francis Scholes, George Hammond, and Agapito Rey, even the contemporary state archivist and historian at the time of the Civil Rights era, Myra Allen Jenkins, historians were mesmerized and often celebrated in Mexico's colonial past, the deeds of conquistadors and the tales of their colonial projects. At the same time, they simultaneously defended the land grant education program of the United States as the fair fulfillment of U.S. treaty obligations under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Communal land ownership, in many of their minds, was a vestige of pre-modern societies and led to the inefficient use of land and hampered economic development. Land grant common lands, the ejido that served as protection from the outside world and an avenue for the growth and health of the community, in their minds, were, was inherently aggressive. Now, um, Gilberto Espinosa, the brother-in-law of Senator Dennis Chavez and member of one of New Mexico's most powerful Hispano families stated that he didn't have any just claim, or neither, and, and Hispanos in general didn't have any just claim to lands that his ancestors willingly departed with. Then again, as a lawyer, he did not depend on those resource rights to make a living. Refuting Alianza claims, Myra Ellen Jenkins stated that the fact remains that twice land grant claimants had their day in court, once before the Surveyor General and once before the Court of Private Land Claims. Ignoring the inconsistency of land grant decisions and the questionable and unethical practices of land grant lawyers like Katrin, like Thomas Katrin and Stephen Elkins, Jenkins, who believed that the U.S. failed to protect Pueblo land claims, conversely held that the U.S. had done right for herederos. She worked diligently to protect Pueblo land and water rights, filing briefs in Indian Claims Commission cases for Laguna and other Pueblos in the 1960s and 70s. But her, and her, her conservative reading of colonial laws when interpreting Hispano land rights relaxed and her liberal readings that supported the Pueblo cause. And her writings focused on the deterioration of Pueblo land and water resources by surrounding Hispanos who encroached on their lands. 
Reyes then was working against a considerable tide in New Mexico history, one that celebrated a people's history but implicitly questioned the legitimacy of their claims of injustice. Now, Reyes attempted to reach out to public communities but, but was rebuffed many times. He nonetheless tied their causes together in Alianza literature, claiming that all Spanish and Indian pueblos were free forever, and reminding those detractors of the Alianza who criticized the herederos Spanish colonial past that land grant heirs were Indo Hispanos, free people born of a Spanish law of October of 1514 that legalized the miscegenation between Spaniards and Indians. For generations, New Mexico's political elite encouraged their constituents to pursue training and education that would better equip themselves to compete in the inevitably changing economy. Gilberto Espinosa, Dennis Chavez, Fabian Chavez, Joseph Montoya, Men who themselves were born of rural means felt that the life of the agrarian village was the thing of the past and served as a shackle to development. Now, Reyes <clears throat> argued the contrary. He impelled herederos to fight for their land rights and pushed the federal government to offer more than welfare, to own up to their obligations under the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo. Tijerina's dictum they stole your land and gave you powdered milk, had a grain of truth to it, though he greatly overestimated the passivity of New Mexicans. The level of dependence across northern New Mexico had created an expectation of federal and state governments amongst an increasingly urban or semi-urban population. As Hispanos became more and more alienated from land, the expectations they held of the federal government gradually were transformed. Demands for economic, cultural, or environmental justice <coughs> were supplanted by calls for the maintenance and extension of government welfare programs. With prospects for land reparation apparently absent, Hispano poverty conditioned their relationship with the state to the point that rather than demanding justice, they often only pleaded for survival. They has offered a competing vision, a utopian egalitarian fiction that preached a communal society in a mass society that exalted the individual. Through his relentless activism, Reyes traveled the state in the early years of the Alianza, re-engaging people and compelling them to reclaim land rights and social justice that had been denied them for over half a century since the closing of the Court of Federal Land Claims. Now for the Chicano movement, Reyes offered this realization of Aztlan, the mythic homeland of the Chicanos. But for Novo Mexicanos, Tijerina's rhetoric engaged heirs to demand justice of the federal government that denied its treaty-born obligations. Ultimately, Reyes' success in organizing New Mexico land grant heirs stemmed from his ability to legitimize their historical presence, but not through a contextualized historical knowledge of the peculiarities of land loss of each land grant. Rather, he did this through the building of a grand narrative. From 1514 Spanish laws that legitimated marriage between Spaniards and Indians to Ordenanza 99 of 1543, which declared settlers of the New World to be petty nobility through their possession of land. He also did this through the legal foundation of the settlement of the Western Hemisphere in the Leyes de las Indias, compiled in 1680, all the way through to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, the moment that the U.S. government took its responsibility to hold the property rights of um, the Mexican citizenry. They has connected the land rights of New Mexico's Hispanos to the U.S. Constitution and to the New Mexico Constitution, which he reminded explicitly recognized the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So contextualizing the success of Reyes's rhetoric and the experience of land grant heirs with the federal government across the 20th century places the Alianza more firmly in New Mexico history shedding light on how a preacher born in the poverty of Texas cotton fields has so profoundly affected the land grant movement for nearly half a century. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> well, I own some property north of Las Vegas, San Pedro. In the early 1970s, there was on my property and papers, there was a legal challenge to the ownership of that, that property, as I assume there was throughout northern New Mexico and the Indian areas. What has, whatever happened officially, if anything, 
to those challenges. Um, those particular ones in San Pedro? Um, I, to be absolutely honest, I, could, I couldn't tell you um, exactly what happened with those. I'd have to research it to see what particularly happened there. Um, I'm just thinking in general. But. In, in general, by, by, uh, by the 1870s, you know, this, in, in 76, Elkins uh, introduced that partition suit. And so throughout this time period, if you see this happen not only with these funnels, but with Pueblos as well, um, the territorial government, territorial courts were um, were quite uh, like allergic to communal land ownership, and so you see um, properties and communities like San Pedro uh, being attacked, um, and so you see these these areas get chopped up into very small uh, private tracts, um, and so so generally you have a, a government that's conservative. In, in some ways, but um, it's conservative in its, in its uh, ideology of land ownership, but it's very liberal when it comes to maintaining or managing this. So um, this is where this is what left avenues for land grant speculators to, um, you know, uh, tear apart these grants and you know question the legitimacy of some grants, resurrect grants that have long been defunct and so forth. Can I just give a very brief answer Absolutely. to this question? Uh, in Rio River County, the Corracion, the Abiquiu filed claims on the entire county. And what ultimately happened, I mean, every time we did a title law, a uh, title suit, we'd have to name them. Every time we did a title opinion, we'd have to name them. But the government finally just put a permanent injunction in there against them having any interest in any land in Rio River County. So you'll find it in your abstract of titles to this day. But it has no no legal uh, significance. Yeah, on the <coughs> uh, land grant era, was there any actual land grants that were actually returned to the original families that were taken either by the federal government or or private landowners? Actually, to um, during the the tenure of the Alianza, not a single acre was returned, and the land grab movement has actually achieved more success. Um, after the Civil Rights era, uh, just about two or three years ago, Abiquiu uh, re regained uh, title to uh, about a 40-acre tract of land right on the um, right on the edge of the Rio Chama uh, from the uh, state. I think it was Parks and Recreation, and then it was uh, Highway Department at one time. So that's that's one one case of uh, um, of. Post, I guess post, you say post movement. To me, that <coughs> land grant movement hasn't ended, but post Alianza, land activism being successful, um, and so you know, hence, and that was one of the reasons that the Alianza fell apart was that disillusionment um, of not actually gaining uh, any of this land back. So, so during that time from 1963 to about 77, when the Alianza was pretty much done for all intents and purposes, um, not a single acre was returned. Um, the federal government has yet to return return anything. To any land rights. Um, not even land rights. Um, the U.S. Forest Service has argued that they have allowed more liberal gra uh, grazing and wood cutting policies in the forests of New Mexico and other areas, and so they argue that that's something that they've done to, you know, fulfill this obligation. But no action will transfer the title. What about the interpretation from the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty? What does that come into factor? Well, Unfortunately, the 2001 and 2004 uh, reports by the GAO kind of renege into responsibilities. The way they see it, the United States fulfilled its fiduciary duty and met the obligations of that treaty. And one of the difficulties with this, when, when Reyes tried to pursue this in the 1950s and 60s, he was trying to push Mexico to, because you know Mexico is a signatory of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, not land renters. So he tried to compel the Mexican government to push the U.S. to recognize this treaty. The Mexican government was more interested in maintaining friendly diplomatic and economic relations with its neighbor to the north, and so they refused to do this. They even kicked Reyes out of the country, made him a persona non grata for a number of, of um, six años, you could say. A few Mexican presidents had it out for him. So, and so, um, you know, uh, uh, now, the, those GAO reports, uh, one of them almost being, well, one of them being a decade old now, uh, really claimed that the confirmation process uh, was gave land grant heirs due process. Uh, and it really is a slap in the face when you look at it. And one thing that those reports did is they kind of reinvigorated the land grant movement. 
and there's a very excellent, um, a very excellent uh, contestation or answer to those reports done by uh, David Benavides and Ryan Bolton of New Mexico Legal Aid, and it's available on the State Attorney General's uh, website, where they pick apart the logic of those 2004 and 2001 reports and go land, grant by land grant to show how the federal government was explicitly or implicitly involved in um, the deterioration of these land grant communities. When DNA was active in, in northern New Mexico, I recall that uh, there was a lot of, I'll, I'll characterize it as fear mongering about what he was about to do or trying to do. Has the general opinion of Reyes changed in any, in any particular way? I mean, how do people hold, historians in particular, I suppose, hold him now? Um, I think as, as um, he's not working against that conservative tide from politicians and academics uh, that was so present and so powerful back then, people um, have a, a greater respect for Tijerina. You know, in, in the 1960s, Reyes was, was fighting against a pretty strong conservative uh, Democratic Party and Republican Party, uh, you know, people like Joseph Montoya and Miguel Naranjo and so on, who um, who had problems with Reyes' uh, militancy and his radicalism. Now, uh, it's to the point that there's, you know, there's actually a committee in the New Mexico State Legislature. There's the, the Interim Land Grant Committee. Many of, of these being people who are inspired by Reyes, who grew up in that area. And so, you know, there's this recognition of the value of what he did. So I, I think overall people are, are going to, you know, have a lot of respect for for what he did in, in resurrecting this memory of injustice. Um, at the same time, people are are um, less willing than he is to credit solely him um, for the land grab movement. So uh, so um, historians also, um, I think people are the people are, like I said, you know, the 1960s and 70s, the liberal uh, writers like Peter Nabokov and and uh, Richard Gardner and so on, uh, wrote pretty much hagiographies of Reyes, just writing about how wonderful he was. Um, I think historians now are, are being a bit more critical of, of his tactics and his ultimate successes. So, um, but yeah, you know, it depends. There are still some um, in foreign policy circles and so on who still see Reyes as a, as a strong threat. Um, so, I don't know exactly what you're saying. Would, would you like to talk a little bit about the courthouse rate? The courthouse rate? The courthouse rate. Yeah, um, I don't see how we can talk about him and not yeah. talk about his legal problems. I think it, it passes. It's, it's one thing to call someone uh, militant, and it's another thing. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, the courthouse rate to this day, Reyes um, kind of rebukes the rate. He claims that it wasn't his decision, that he was outvoted. And um, while he was in the Santa Fe prison a few days after the rate, he actually resigned his presidency of the Alianza, believing that people in the Alianza had militant ideas that he didn't share. Um, so from about 1966, the Alianza was growing in power. From 63 to 66, uh, they staged a series of public demonstrations to try to get the state's attention. And um, let's see, in 66, they had this, uh, they had a caravan from Santa Fe to the from Albuquerque to Santa Fe, and it failed to amount to anything. So by October, they occupied the Echo Amphitheater and performed a citizen's arrest of a couple of forest rangers. This is actually why they, this is actually what Reyes went to jail for. A lot of people have the perception or the misconception that he went to jail for the courthouse raid. He actually defended himself to you know, mistrials and, and was cleared. He actually goes to jail for this occupation and assault of a federal officer in 66. And so um, after 66, and uh, you know, he was, the trials kind of got started, but you know, the federal process takes a while. And so Reyes knew he needed to do something even bigger. And so what they were planning in April 1967, the Alianza planned to have a meeting, which they postponed because of uh, federal and state um, policing of their activities. And so uh, by May of 67, Alfonso uh, Sanchez, the DA, arrested Reyes' brother and three other aliancistas and held them in the uh, basement, in the basement jail of the, uh, of the courthouse. 
And so the June 5th raid was to do a citizen's arrest of DA Sanchez for the false imprisonment of the Ariancistas. That's something that tends to fade. People think that they were, you know, they were going in and just arresting, which, you know, Reyes had a habit later on of, of issuing uh, citizen's arrest warrants to people with, you know, very little probable cause, you know, to Chief Justice Warren Berger, to the head of the National Lab, to the Express <coughs> Brief, you know, he, he had a habit of, of, of doing that. Um, but, um, so, so, through the raid, he was actually trying to address the, what he called the false imprisonment of Ariancistas. And then from there, uh, many people cite that as the time that the Alianza started to dip in its popularity. By 66, there was already problems. Um, you know, from, from its founding in 64, a significant portion of Atrisco heirs left the Alianza. Well, yeah, but and I then, mean, remember the, the jailer was beaten to death. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, and, and Larry Calloway was kidnapped, you know. Exactly. So the, um, but one thing is the courthouse raid tends to overshadow the movement. And that's one thing that, I'm, that, that my work is trying to address in the larger land grant. Sure. Um, and, you know, so because because the the raid has nothing really to do with land grants themselves. It has to do with the illegal detainment of people of that organization. But it does have to do with public opinion, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And so Reyes, you know, for in liberal and radical circles, Reyes, is, I mean, Reyes became an international celebrity. You know, this this was on newspapers across Europe and West South America, and you know, he he at times rebuked that celebrity when he was in the midst of his legal troubles. And at other times, you know, once he was paroled from prison, he spent a year just traveling, traveling, you know, giving speeches at, at university after university. And so, you know, it, it kind of depends. And, and that was actually the moment where the audience are very much fractured because in the, um, in the court proceedings, in the trials that came out of the courthouse raid, Reyes separated himself from the other raiders. And there was a popular perception amongst uh, aliancistas that Reyes did this so he can hoard the legal expertise of attorneys like a Thorne and, and Beverly Oxlock, Black Panther attorneys. Um, while Reyes actually had an idea that um, there was significant confusion over who shot Nick Saez and Rojo Salazar. Um, and so um, that by, that if, if Reyes was accused of it and acquitted, then um, other uh, valientes, other raiders, couldn't be accused of, of shooting, you know, uh, these people. And the Salazar murder is, is something really interesting too, because there's a lot of questions of who killed Salazar. Salazar was killed in early '68, um, right before, about a week before he was supposed to uh, uh, testify about the raid. Reyes maintains that Salazar's story was that Reyes didn't shoot him. Um, at first, they have a, a testimony. Uh, a statement by Salazar saying that he saw Reyes shoot him, but just the physics of it were, were impossible because Salazar dived out the window as the bullet entered the bottom of his jaw and at the top. And so there's no way that he could have had his head pitched back with that same trajectory of the bullet. So, so there was big questions of his testimony. So people believe Reyes, of course, accused uh, the federal government, the FBI, of killing Salazar because that would crack their the prosecution's case against him. And uh, the 19... Let's see, Zimbabwe Pavaka, so mid 1980s uh, Attorney General report by Tony Anaya pretty much guessed that more than likely it was a sympathizer of the Alianza and the Tijerina, but no direct Alianza member was involved in, in, in you know, bludgeoning him to death. Yes. If you were able to take an opinion poll in Rio Arriba County, the Alianza, uh, how would in your opinion, how would you characterize how that would turn out? Um, I think, you know, if this was in the 1960s, the height of the Alianza, it'd be, you know, a, a, a be divided. There were those who, you know, uh, benefited from the political patronage of Naranjo, mm -hmm. the Naranjo political machine. And so they were, many of those were, were pretty satisfied. Um, through the 70s, I think a lot of people from Rio Riva became disillusioned with Reyes, um, because you know, the, the movement fell apart. His, his personality began to ellipse, or <coughs> eclipse, you know, to eclipse the movement. Um, in the 80s, you know, Reyes was a passing memory. In the 90s, his popularity got stronger again. When I asked my grandfather, who lived in Alicia, about Reyes, he had a, generally a pretty positive opinion about him, but not necessarily one that was strong enough to get him to you know, actively uh, follow Reyes. And so, 
you know, it changes with time. I think right now the opinion of Reyes is, is pretty positive. You know, I don't think there's anybody, there's, there's not a significant portion of people who, who uh, hold him in disregard. So I, I think it's, it's kind of ebbed and flowed, it's changed with time. Um, at this point in migrant activism, because Reyes isn't here, I mean, he was in Mexico for years and now he's, now he's living in, in Juarez. So, you know, if Reyes was here, it'd probably be different. If, truthfully, if Reyes was here, he'd probably damage his own reputation more than help him. But with his absence, we <coughs> come to regard him pretty positively. Of course, um, Mike Scarborough's lived in Rio de County for, or has been in Rio de County for years. I'm sure that you could speak to the popularity of Reyes and, you know, how well he's held. And my father was in the courthouse in the rain because he had just arraigned Reyes' brother. Mm -hmm. I have a little insight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, all right. One, one more story. What do you see the future of uh, potential uh, resolution of la land grant disputes in light of what the federal government has said that they've done their fiduciary responsibilities and they no longer have uh, uh, a need to, uh, to take this up? What, what does that bode? Well, I think, um, well, Representative Benry Buhan has, has pursued this, and, you know, it depends, it really depends on the government. I mean, oddly enough, some of land grants' greatest allies are uh, people who push for private land rights. So, you know, in the 90s, one of land grants' biggest allies was New Gingrich, who wanted to shrink the, the size of the public, of the federal public domain. Um, so now, now that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo report has been published, uh, you know, and legal avenues have been explored for decades and decades. You know, uh, I mean, Anton Chico, land grant after land grant, the Colote are involved in these, these, land, in, in these disputes. Uh, so big picture, I think it has to be some sort of legislation that either repeals the Sandoval case, which would affect San Miguel del Vado and six of the land grants, um, or because, you know, the, the, the interpretation has been held by scholars almost ever since that decision that that case was, that that, that um, Supreme Court case was wrong. You know, they misinterpreted uh, the rights of community land grants to their hated lands. So that would be one of the avenues. And the other is the creation of a Hispano Claims Commission. Model maybe much like the Indian Claims Commission that was active from the 50s through the 80s. So something that we'll go through and, and look at, you know, look case by case at these claims. You know, yet, it's yet another adjudication process but one that has more protective measures, you know, to, to guard against, uh, you know, land speculation, which, you know, is much harder to do now than it was in the days of catching the dollars. So I think pretty much, you know, political, it's, it's really political avenues. I think legal avenues in all this time of, of uh, you know, all this time of court decisions, the court has proved that they will not uphold communal rights. So. I think that's the, the main avenue of the play. Thank you.